بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I will start um, with some recitation of the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Allah يعلم ما تحمل كل أنثى وما تغيب الأرحام وما تزداد وكل شيء عنده بمقدار Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah says that Allah knows what every female carries. So when a woman um, becomes pregnant, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's in her stomach. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, in, this, in this statement, Al-Awfi rahimahullah reports from Ibn Abbas that he said, and Allah knows that which the womb loses prematurely, i.e. referring to miscarriage. وَمَا <laughs> تَزْدَادْ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that fetus that reaches a full term or even more than the full term. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us with life and death. And yet, it's normal that uh, parents, when they have a child, they're the ones who die before the child. But there comes situations where the child dies before the parents. And this is a test that's so difficult for the parents. And I want to give you some background. It is a difficult test. But I do these programs where we develop you know, personal development, time mastery and money mastery and so on, and psychology. And whenever I'd have people introduce themselves, I started noticing a trend amongst them. A sister would stand up to introduce herself and she would say, that my child died such and such a time ago and she's almost crying and she says that I've gotten over it, alhamdulillah. And I hear from her voice that she hasn't gotten over it. And another brother would introduce himself and he said that my wife and I experienced the death of a child since then I've been turning back and developing myself and so on and so forth. And a third person would tell me outside of class that being very stubborn with people, every time somebody wants to know why is this person being so stubborn, he said, I'll never let them, I'll never tell them why, but the reason why is that my wife and I lost a child. And so I started seeing this in the community, and then I looked out to the community and said to myself, where does somebody go in the Muslim community when they've lost a child? Who is there to support and who is there to help? And when you really look at it for the normal uh, Muslim woman and Muslim uh, um, man, there's nobody in the community for them to turn to. Nobody is specialized in this. Nobody knows what to say to them. And so usually the counselors are this woman's friends. And they don't know what to say. So in my experience in, in talking to people in this situation, their friends may be speechless. And it's an awkward silence. So the friends, because of the awkwardness of the situation, they decide to abandon the sister and leave her alone to grieve by herself. Others may say things off the top of their head and they don't really know what they're saying. They mean well, but they say incorrect things. So a woman begins crying and somebody tells her, it's haram to cry. And then the woman said, it's haram to cry. Another person would say to the woman, your child is in paradise, why are you crying about that? Making the woman feel not only as her child died, but then she feels guilty as if Islam is insensitive to the situation. And so today inshallah ta'ala, I actually prepared this lecture for those people who experience such, um, such a tragedy and how inshallah ta'ala, the situation is the situation so that they can understand what happens. <clears throat> but before I begin, I wanted to give you some quick tips. Quick tips. Because usually when people hear the lecture, I'm going to mention many things and many lessons. And what happens is that you might get lost in the lessons. And you might say, you know, it was a good lecture, but you might forget the details of it. So I like to give the zubda or the cream of, of, of the conclusion of it from the beginning when your mind is the sharpest. So then inshallah ta'ala afterwards you can... Remember at least the beginning part. 
We had a, a, a neighbor of ours, very close to our family, and mashallah, you know, we're always um, calling on this on our neighbor, have you given birth, have you given birth, have you given birth, until we get the call that the birth happened last night and the baby died soon after that. And these are close neighbors. And then comes the condolences. When everybody's waiting for the aqiqah, when everybody's waiting for the celebration of this baby, it's instead a janazah. And as I walked with this brother, and when you're giving condolences, a lesson number one that I'll tell you, condolences don't have to be at the home of that family. You can give condolences by phone, you can give condolences at the masjid, you can give condolences as I went downstairs in my building, and this brother was coming out for prayer with his family, his father and his father-in-law, and I walked with him. And I told him, let me tell you some quick lessons that I learned about this topic. And I would assume that the brother, because they are a practicing family and they know that it had been like two days since, um, since the child had died, since his daughter had passed away, that I would assume people know this. But in reality, most people, this doesn't come up. This topic is not... A popular topic, I'm sure for many of you, it's the first time you've ever heard somebody speak about a topic like this in Islam. Normally we're repeating the topics we've heard before, but a topic like this, so sensitive, and it happens to so many people, and I'll give you some statistics in a moment, yet it's not mentioned very often. So I said, number one, number one, being truthful and honest, you're going to care about your child, and you're going to long for your child for the rest of your life. There's no getting over it. Your child died and you'll be 75 years old and you'll still remember them. And every day you'll remember your child. So I said to him, I said, where is your child? They're in paradise. Doesn't the Muslim, if you've not been tested with this test, is your heart not thinking of paradise? And I said, for this man, for my brother, your child is in paradise. And your heart is always going to be attached to that location for the rest of your life. Every day, every moment while you're sitting with people, every time you remember, your heart's going to go to Jannah. So not only are you longing for Jannah, from here till the day you die, you're going to have a bridge from your mind and your heart to paradise at all times to for the rest of your life. Number two, I don't assume anybody who, who's lost a child can, um, that, well, at any moment they can cry. Any moment they can cry. Bring up the issue, and if you've lost a child already, I can tell if you lost a child. The eyes start to water, they're remembering the situation that took place. At any time they can cry. Yet you go to somebody else who hasn't been tested with this, and they're complaining why their heart is so hard. They're complaining, I can't cry. And I would say to this brother, for the rest of your life, any time you wish to cry for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you just remember your daughter. And your heart will be turned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And your heart will become soft. Now these two lessons from here, the third one, is that when your child would pass the age of puberty, when they, pass, uh, when they become baligh, you wish safety for your child right? And you wish success and prosperity for your child, correct? Ultimately, as a good Muslim, you want your child to go to Jannah. Nothing will matter more to you than your child going to Jannah. Yet when they get older, there's a chance that, you know, maybe they'll be misguided. You love your child so much, now they're guaranteed safety and they're guaranteed paradise. That what you would ultimately wish for, for your child, is now guaranteed. There's no janazah for the child, except that in the janazah, the person is praying not for the child, but for the parents of the child. In Salat al-Janazah, the prayer, the funeral prayer, you're not praying for the baby. The baby doesn't need your prayer, because it made no sin. You're not asking forgiveness for the baby. The baby is guaranteed jannah. You're asking forgiveness for the parents that they be patient and prepare for this. Now let's begin. Let's start with airplanes. 
And what can an airplane crash teach us about patients? Now, in um, November 12th, 1996, there was an airplane crash that um, went down in history as the largest in-air airplane crash that ever took place. In-air meaning two airplanes colliding with each other in the air. The number of people that were killed were 312, and it was a Saudi airline flight that was traveling from New Delhi in India to the Haran in, um, in Saudi Arabia. The pilot of the airplane was a Muslim pilot, 1996. And as the flight went up, and it was very smoggy in, in New Delhi, and with the different airlines coming in and people speaking different, the universal language for all these um, airplanes is English. But with different accents and so on, and there was a Russian pilot, air traffic controller told the man, and he had a translator, he said, go at 16,000 feet because you have another airline coming in at 17,000 feet. There was a confusion in the numbers and in the language and the translations and so on, and they heard 17,000 feet repeated a couple of times, so they went to 7,000 feet, 17,000 feet, on a collision course with these two airplanes. Now the sky is completely um, full of smog, full of clouds, and they can't really see what's in front of them, so they're going by their, um, their instruments in front of them, and they can't see. And as they're in the air, all of a sudden from through the clouds comes an airplane, and you can imagine the speeds that these two airplanes are going in, and the captain sees the airplane and he's got about a split second before the crash, before impact. So this is what happens. Black Box records the statement of the captain, who's a Muslim captain um, on that Saudi Airline flights. This is what it sounds like. Layla! And then it smashes and it's over. They went down, the airplane turned upside down and they plummeted to the ground. That box destroyed, they went to another recording. As the captain, as the airplane went downwards, the captain was saying, La ilaha illallah, subhanallah, astaghfirullah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. All the way down, and everybody was killed in the airplane. Now I thought about this. And, and maybe I'll give you a little um, example. Imagine yourself that here you are, you're in Kuwait, and you know, you're just backing up with your car and you're like, la la la, la la la, boom! The car, you hit something. What's the first thing that comes to your mouth? What's the first thing? You just, you, some, something just hits your car, boom! And you say? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yes, yeah, some of you would rather not say what you would say. That's why I wanted to give you the comparison. Because at times of shock, and that's a calamity for us, you back up, you maybe hit somebody, you hit a car, you smashed your car, something like that. The first thing that comes to your tongue is not La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, astaghfirullah. It's not that. It comes from your heart and it comes unconscious. There's no time to think about it. It comes from your heart. And it's usually, may Allah forgive us, it's a swear word that comes up. This is coming from our heart. May Allah forgive us. So that's why I'm thinking more about this pilot. He has no time to consciously think, hey, we're about to die, let me say the shahada now. There's no time for that. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ كَانَ آخِرُ كَلَامِهِ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever, their last words of this, of this earth are لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ they enter paradise. And when we hear it at times of ease, we don't really understand how it could be difficult to say that. Yet when those moments come, they come from the hearts, and they come based on how you live your life. Now, I was in a Turkish airline flight, and Turkish Airlines recently, I think they're sponsoring Manchester United, right? But I'm kind of like against Turkish Airlines. I hope there's no representatives from Turkish Airlines here. And the reason I'm against Turkish Airlines is because I had a really bad experience with Turkish Airlines. They kind of like put us in an airplane that was like from the 1930s or something like that. Big monster dinosaur airplane that went up. And in the middle of the air, 
this airplane basically like, and, and this was a flight from Istanbul to um, Jeddah. And we were going for Hajj. So everybody basically on the airplane was Muslim and they were going for Hajj. So it's a nice, full of Hajjis and so on. What do Hajjis talk about on the airplanes? I wonder what's for lunch. <laughs> that's basically it. Yes, they're Hajjis, but you know, that's just the way it is. So everybody's like, you know, things are distracted and you know, the um, carts are going out. All of a sudden, the airplane just drops from the sky. The food goes to the ceiling and, and I, I think just to emphasize the situation, I saw the stewardesses crying. And I'm thinking to myself, if they're crying, <laughs> then we're in big trouble here. And my, um, my wife turned to me, she was sitting away, I was sitting beside her brother, and she turned to me, she's like, Muhammad, Muhammad, I'm like, I know what you're going to say. I'm like, what? She's like, forgive me, I, I knew you were going to say that, because we're going to die now, now you want me to forgive you. And I'm like, I forgive you, it's okay, we're about to die here, but khair inshallah. In the airplane, I looked around, I don't think you've ever seen an entire airplane of people crying and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everybody on the airplane was crying. Initially, all the women screamed on the airplane. And then the next time the airplane dropped and continued to drop and try to get up and drop again, um, there was a chant of La ilaha illallah on the airplane. Forget the food. Who cares about the food? Who cares about the chocolate cake? Who cares about all that stuff? This is the time to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I looked over the, um, the audience... This is Muhammad al-Sharif always observing people and studying them and looking over. Even in a moment like this, I said to myself, SubhanAllah, now we're real hajis. And I asked forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he had to do this to us to make us hajis. Because that reaction comes out of a person trying to be patient, but yet your iman can go up through thankfulness. It can go up through thankfulness or it can go up through patience. Most people don't have thankfulness. So when the hard times come along, then they become patient, their iman goes up. But then when the good times come back, they forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Things are going good, they have a good job, they have everything's going, the economy's great, everything's going good. They're not at the masjid, they're not this, this and that. And then the economy goes down, now they're back in the masjid, they're turning back to Allah, they're crying. This, the economy goes up, they leave the masjid. Do you see the problem? If you looked at a chart, that would mean that if Allah wished good for the people, He would put punishment upon them. Because they only learn through punishment. Because when Allah gives them gifts, they're not thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so what a person needs to do, I mean this is one of the lessons that I learned from this situation, is that I, after every like hardship like that, I sit down, I open up my journal, I start writing, what do I learn from this? And one of the things that I learned is I don't like learning in situations like this so much. <laughs> oh Allah, I made a determination. Oh Allah, I'll be thankful to you. So that at the good times, when I'm on a nice beach, sipping a nice pina colada, oh Allah, I will be thankful and reflect and use that for your sake, oh Allah. Okay, now, alhamdulillah, we survived. I'm here today. Alhamdulillah. Now when I go on an airplane, watch this. Okay, so I'm, I'm in business class. I'm lying down flat. And they say, please buckle your seatbelt so we don't disturb you <laughs> if, in case there's turbulence. And I'm lying flat and the airplane bounces in my sleep. Bounces. La ilaha illallah. Bounce. La ilaha illallah. I'm sleeping. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. To say your shahada in your sleep. Bounce, la ilaha illallah, alhamdulillah, turbulence. Why am I doing that? Because my body has been programmed that when the airplane bounces, it's time to say shahada. Right? And it's automatic. Now let's go to this situation with the child. What does that teach you about patience? I would say this is something very deep. When a person goes through a calamity of this nature... And I'll give you an example um, of one brother. <clears throat> and this brother, I was coaching him by phone. And one week, he didn't pick up the phone. And later, he told me that his uncle died and he had to travel to Atlanta. 
and visit his uncle. That was one week. The next week he phoned me and he said, Muhammad, and so he was, very, you know, a death in the family. The uncle was very close to him, very close to his mother, and he was very affected by this. And we spoke about the death. The next week his wife gave birth to a baby boy, Sa'ad. And we celebrated the birth of Sa'ad and we said, SubhanAllah, death one week and a birth the next week. The third week, the brother called me and he said, Muhammad, today Sa'ad died. He died one week later. Now he explains, this brother, if you meet him, there are certain people, they've had the child die and they have come out stronger. And there are other people who have had a child die and they've come out weaker. And I, what I'm going to show you is the difference between the two. Now his child died, and this is the, the situation. His child was sick. They told him, come on, um, come on Monday after the weekend, and we'll um, check on him. He went to the hospital. The child wasn't doing so good. He was waiting outside, and then um, waiting in the lobby with his, uh, in, in the waiting area, and then he felt something was different. And then he just knocked on the door. He came forward. He said, I think something's different. They immediately took his, his son. His son had died in his hands. They took his son. They pushed him out of the room. And from the window, he saw as they tried doing everything. But he knew his son had died. And he drove home alone. Waiting to get home to his wife to tell her. That he went with his son to the hospital. And he's not coming home with him. And there's many stories like this. His son called, her, his wife called him on the phone to ask him how was Saad doing. And he said, he said to me, he said, Muhammad, I couldn't like not tell her. So there on the highway, he parked to the side and he said, Saad's dead. And now he said, Muhammad, the first thing my wife said was, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. That's the first, that's from the heart. The first thing that comes when you lose your mind in the situation. First thing that came to her mouth was, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. I want to remind you of that Turkish airline flight. There are tests that you go through in life that if you pass those tests, it programs you to say la ilaha illallah unconsciously. You can't not say it now. Because of passing the test earlier in your life, if this sister has a situation when her car is about to crash and she's about to die, inshallah ta'ala, that she has already passed the test earlier in her life, her unconscious is now connected to la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And that's the power of passing these tests. Sometimes you see people, they'll say, I can't control my anger. And I would say, do you know what the consequences of that is? The consequence of that may be that when you come to your death and you're about to get hit by a car, rather than la ilaha illallah coming out, your anger might come out. And one of the consequences, maybe you might not say la ilaha illallah at your deathbed. Maybe you'll get angry at the end of your life. And, you, and because of not being patient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not following the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la taghdab, don't get angry. The person says, I can't control myself. And they think it's no big deal. And they disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again and again until they lose control. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Bani Israel, wa ushribu fi qulubihim al ajla bi kufrihim. Allah said, when they worshiped the calf, Allah said they drank the love of the calf in their heart to worship them because of their disbelief. They kept disobeying and disobeying until they had no control. They just had to do it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us.